Today we are going to begin a, a new study, and I, I believe it will be an especially exciting, challenging, and powerful one. You know, it's common for us to speak about the great letters or epistles of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote more than any other. The Apostle Peter wrote two, two epistles. Uh, James wrote one. But did you know that Jesus wrote some letters as well? Seven of them in all. And that's what we're going to be looking at starting here today. Our Lord Jesus addressed a series of letters to a number of believers in seven different cities. A friend of mine, Pastor Phil Bickle, who many of you know, in a book that he wrote years ago, talked about Jesus' letters as being the, uh, the, the writings of one who was a church analyst, one who was a, uh, a, an advisor to, to churches and congregations, showing them what the Father desires for them. And so today, we're going to begin looking at the letters of Jesus, his epistles, to seven churches in what at that time was known as Asia Minor, in what we today call Western Turkey. They are powerful letters, and they speak very directly, not just to people living 2,000 years ago, but to you and to me and to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, how we bless your holy name and we thank you for the way you have communicated with us throughout the ages. Through your prophets, your Hebrew prophets, you spoke to your people and called them to yourself. Through the apostles, you have called an entire world to a knowledge of you, the living God, through faith in Jesus the Messiah. And through these letters of our Lord Jesus, Lord, you speak to us today. May we hear your voice clearly. May we respond to you and all that you offer. And may we be transformed by the power of your word that speaks to us here in the 21st century with the very power that it spoke 20 centuries ago in the first. We pray this in your strong name, Lord Jesus, as we come before you, our Heavenly Father. Amen. Well, we're going to begin looking at the letters of Jesus that are recorded in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Now, I know the moment we mention the book of Revelation, people are curious and they're also sometimes put off because they say that's such a confusing book. Trust me, there's nothing confusing about what Jesus has to say to us in these letters. And this morning, we are going to be looking at the first of them. Before we do that, I think it appropriate for us to uh, just take a look at uh, the various towns and cities to which those letters were addressed by our Lord Jesus. Jesus appeared to his best friend, one of the apostles, John, who at that time was in exile on the island of Patmos. You'll see that on the, uh, the map in front of you. John was in exile, having been uh, sent there by the Roman emperor, and it was in that capacity cut off from all of his fellow believers, that the Lord Jesus himself appeared to John and revealed his glory and his greatness, but also dictated a series of seven letters. Those letters went to churches at Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum and Thyatira, Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Today we're going to be looking at the letter addressed to the church at Ephesus. But before we do that, I think it wise for us just to step back for a moment and uh, reflect on the commonalities among these seven letters. Although each is directed to a unique group of believers, each also follows a similar pattern, and that pattern is really quite remarkable. Jesus begins by identifying himself with a characteristic that he, he revealed to John while John was on Patmos. If you read the book of Revelation chapter 1, you see this amazing event as John in exile on Patmos suddenly sees the risen Christ in all of his glory and he describes him in these incredibly beautiful, powerful, breathtaking terms. Those terms are the terms that Jesus will then use as he addresses each one of these, these towns and the believers in them. He begins with a characteristic of himself. He continues 
with a commendation, commending the believers in that particular town or village or city for their faithfulness, for the things they have done well in their, their walk with the Lord and in their faith. Then he goes on to give correction, pointing out those areas where they are in need of change, in need of, of transformation, quite frankly, in need of repentance. And following that, he gives a command, and the command always sounds the same. Listen to what the Spirit says. I'm absolutely convinced that that command of the Lord Jesus applies directly to each and every one of us today, because what he is saying to us is to listen to the Spirit of the living God. Allow the Spirit of God to guide, direct, and control your life. And then finally, at the end of those letters, Jesus calls for a commitment. He makes a commitment to us and reminds us of the importance of being wholly committed to him. The word that he uses is a fascinating word in the Greek New Testament. It is a word, it's Greek nikao, and it literally means to be victorious. That phrase will occur over and again in each one of these seven letters. Jesus will say to those who are victorious, here is what I give and what I offer. He is the one who has won the victory. And now by faith in him, you and I can also be victorious in our daily walk. That is what our Lord desires of each of us. And that is what he is calling us to here in these seven letters. You know, it's rather fascinating as you look through the New Testament, you find that that, that word victorious or, or to be a victor is a word that is used repeatedly. In fact, 28 times in the New Testament. What is especially fascinating, though, it appears 17 times in the book of Revelation alone, six times in John's first epistle, and one time in the Gospel of John. So of the 28 uses of this word nikao, or victorious, or I am a victor, of the 28 uses, 24 of them occur in John's writings. It's one of his favorite words, and he got it from Jesus. And so... Let's take a look at what he has to say. This is what we read. We read, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. Revelation 2, verse 1. Write these words to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, there are a lot of things we know about Ephesus that are really quite fascinating and help us better understand not only the situation in which these believers found themselves, but also help us understand why Jesus directed his words to them in such a forceful and powerful manner. Ephesus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. In fact, there are more Roman ruins in Ephesus today than there are in Rome. <laughs> it's, it's really true. It's an amazing place to see. Great columns, the ruins of tremendous public buildings. Ephesus was a city of approximately 250,000. That's our best guess. And was one of the most prominent, wealthy, and important cities in the entire empire. Ephesus was also known for some of its remarkable buildings. This is a theater at Ephesus that still stands today after 2,000 years. It is the very theater that is mentioned in the book of Acts chapter 19 when the apostle Paul and his missionary team spent a couple of years in Ephesus. This theater seats 24,000 people three massive tiers, and it stands almost a hundred feet high. But dominating everything in Ephesus is a building that no longer exists. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the great temple of Artemis, or Diana, as the Romans called her. Here is an artist's reconstruction of what that massive building looked like. The temple of Artemis, all that has survived, by the way, is a couple of pieces of column. But the temple of Artemis was four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. It was 200 feet, almost 200 feet across and almost 400 feet deep. It dominated the landscape and was one of the, the great buildings in all of Ephesus. It was a reminder that the Ephesians worshipped a host of idols and false deities. And yet, in that city, 
there was a tremendous gathering of converts to Jesus and the message of the scriptures. Many people, hundreds and hundreds, came to know him as the Apostle Paul and Timothy, as Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos and many others labored in Ephesus. In fact, from Ephesus, we are told the gospel spread out into all the surrounding region. And most of the gatherings of believers that are addressed by Jesus here in Revelation 2 and 3 can trace their spiritual lineage back to the believers in Ephesus. And so when the Lord Jesus speaks to them and speaks to them first, He is speaking to the individuals who first heard the message of his incredible love, of his sacrificial death, of his resurrection, and he has powerful words to share with them. Those are the words we are going to consider this morning. And so I would invite you to open your Bibles now to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and we are going to start out with all of verse 1. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now maybe you're saying to yourself, well, what in the world does that mean? Jesus told us in chapter one, when he first met John and revealed himself in all of his glory, John saw him as one who held seven stars in his hands. And those seven stars, we are told, represent the congregations in the seven cities that Jesus would address. In addition to that, those stars represent the angels that watch over those congregations. And the seven lampstands stand for the congregations themselves, the believers, and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their midst. Jesus is the one who watches over his children. And here in these opening words, we have a powerful reminder to each and every one of us. And that is that the Lord Jesus knows us just as surely as he knew those believers in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago. He knows you and he knows me. He knows our heart. He knows our love for him. He knows our struggles. He knows the deepest desires of our soul. And he is near to us. And he is watching over us. And he reminds you and me in these words and by his Holy Spirit that we are precious to him. And so, these are the words of him, the Lord Jesus, who holds those angels in his right hand and walks among his congregations, his believers, his beloved children. This is what Jesus then says, verse two. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Isn't that an amazing and incredible and uplifting commendation from the Lord? He says, I know you. I know what you've gone through. For these believers here in Ephesus, these were hardworking followers of the Lord Jesus. They were people who persevered in their faith. Even when things got difficult, They continued to hang on to the Lord and to his goodness and his mercy and his grace. And as we read those words, they are words that call each and every one of us to look at our own lives and our relationship with the Lord. Are we persevering in our faith? Are we working for him? You know, working for the Lord is not simply a matter of volunteering at a a, a particular activity. It is a matter of living for the Lord Jesus daily, of allowing his love to show in our lives, of demonstrating that in the way we treat others. He is saying to this group of believers, you guys have worked hard and you have persevered. Not only that, he says, I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. It doesn't mean that these believers were ornery and and bitter toward their unbelieving neighbors. It means they did not fall into the trap of simply going along with what the rest of the world says. 
Today, it's so important for us in a world that continuously bombards us with attitudes and views that are absolutely the opposite of biblical values. It's important not to raise those things up and say, well, that's okay, or that, that's fine. It doesn't matter what you do or what you believe. The believers in Ephesus realize, no, our worldview is important. And it's important for us to be anchored in God's word and firmly rooted in the Holy Spirit's presence, filled with the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, you guys, you have persevered well. You have tested those who are false teachers, false apostles, he says, and you've found them to be false. Not only that, but you've endured hardships for my name and you haven't grown weary. What about you in your walk with the Lord? Are you feeling a little weary right now? What the Lord Jesus is saying is, I know what you've gone through. He's saying, persevere, hang in there, because I am with you and I will never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. After that commendation, the Lord Jesus then gives correction to the believers at Ephesus. You know, it's always more fun to hear good things. It's painful to hear correction, but correction is absolutely necessary. And the Lord corrects us, not because he is angry with us or doesn't care for us. He corrects us because he loves us and he wants us to experience the fullness of his love, his presence, his peace, his goodness, his forgiveness, and his power. This then is what Jesus says, words of correction to the believers at Ephesus. Verse four, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now those are sobering words, aren't they? Those words cause us to almost gulp. But Jesus speaks those words, not out of anger, but rather out of mercy and out of love. He says, you have persevered, you haven't grown weary, but you have lost the love you had at first. Another way of translating that is, you've lost your first love. What is our first love? (laughs) It's the Lord himself. Jesus was once asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he said, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. When we know the love of God in Christ, our natural response is to love him as he has first loved us. And when we know his love and love him, He also motivates us to love others, including our enemies, to love all, to recognize that the Lord Jesus died not just for my sin, but for the sins of the entire world. And he loves them desperately and he wants them to come to himself. And so because he loves me, I love him. And because he loves me, I also want to love others, the very ones that he loves. Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, you have maintained your proper beliefs, but you've wandered away from the love you had at first. What he is saying is it is important to be orthodox, to to believe the right things, but it is also important to practice the right things, to love God, to love others, because without love, our beliefs really are are barren. Without love, we may have the right stuff up here, but our hearts are in the wrong place. And Jesus says, this is serious. This This is dangerous. And so he pleads with these believers, consider how far you have fallen. Repent. In other words, turn around, repent, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. 
I find it very interesting that in these seven letters that Jesus addresses to his children, to his believers, seven times in the seven letters, he tells these believers to repent. So often we tend to think that repentance is for ungodly people. Instead, repentance is for everyone, and especially those who know and love the Lord. He's calling us to turn back to him, to have a change of mind as well as a change of behavior, and to allow him to guide, motivate, direct, and lead our lives. That's what Jesus says by way of correction. And then he gives this command, Revelation 2, verse 6. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. After giving correction, Jesus goes on to once again commend these believers. He says, even though you've wandered from your first love, you haven't wandered so far that you have lost your commitment to the values of the God who loved you and has given everything for you. He says, you haven't given way to the beliefs of the Nicolaitans. Now, in all honesty, we don't really know much about the Nicolaitans. But what we read later in chapter 2 would indicate that the Nicolaitans were people who said, it doesn't matter how you behave All that matters is that you're a decent person inside. It doesn't matter what you do because God has saved us and and so do whatever you want. Sin however you desire. Jesus says, I am so thankful that you haven't fallen into that trap. You know, in our world today, there are many who say something very similar. They say it doesn't matter how we behave. After all, God forgives. I'm a sinner. God forgives. It's a great arrangement. I sin. He forgives. That's not the attitude that a believer is to have. A believer is one who's humble before God, one who does repent daily, and one who realizes because God has given everything to me, I want to live for him and serve him with my life. I don't want to simply behave like the rest of the world. I want to let his light be reflected in my life. Jesus says, I, you have this in your favor. You've rejected those false practices. And then he says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Allow that still, small voice of God who speaks to us by his word and by his spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to direct, guide, encourage, and lead you. That's what Jesus says, and that is an amazing command. Finally, he says, to the one who is victorious, I love that word, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What is the tree of life? (laughs) Go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis begins with the creation, with God then making a garden, the garden of Eden. And in that garden, he planted a tree, the tree of life, which enabled our first parents to live forever. What Jesus is saying is, those who trust me, those who believe in me and follow me, you will live forever. Because he has won the victory for us at the cross and the empty tomb by his death and resurrection and ascension, when he returns... He will give to all believers, not only new bodies, but the right to eat from the tree of life. In other words, to live forever. It's very interesting when you look at the Bible. It begins in a garden and it ends in a garden. It begins in the garden of Eden. It ends with the world recreated with a new heaven and a new earth and believers eating the tree of life. Jesus says, to you who are victorious, who follow me, who listen to my word, who hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to you, I will give the right to eat the tree of life in the paradise of God. What a great way to end a letter, isn't it? You know, can you imagine receiving such a letter in your own mailbox? 
or your own, if you're using an email, your own uh, iPad or, or computer, a letter from Jesus saying, my desire is that you be victorious and that you live forever. That's what he offers his children. And that's what he's speaking about here in the first of these letters that we are studying today. Now, when you look at that, you realize that letter certainly had remarkable application for believers in the first century. For the people in Ephesus, I'm sure it was a blessing, an encouragement, a cause for reflection and renewal, and assurance and peace. For you and me, it is the same thing. This is Jesus' letter, and it is directed not just to people long ago, but to us today. And he is saying, listen to what I have to say to you and allow me to do amazing things in your life. He is good. He really is. And his desire for each of us is that we believe his truth, practice his truth, love as we have been loved, and as a result, are victorious because he has already won the victory. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's take a moment for prayer, shall we? Father, how we thank you for your word of truth. Lord Jesus, how we praise you for the victory that you have won, that you are the conqueror, and that because you have conquered, we are also more than conquerors through you who love us. Lord God, may the words of our Lord Jesus speak powerfully into our hearts in these coming days. May each of us recommit ourselves to you, rejoicing in your truth, seeking to practice that in our lives, basking in your love, and showing that love to others, even those who make our lives difficult. May we realize nothing matters more than knowing you and following you. It is in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. I'd like to invite you to join with me now as we speak together the prayer our Lord Jesus himself taught us. And as we speak that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, let's reflect on the fact that not only did he teach us to pray, but he continues to speak to us today. And in his letter, he calls us to himself. Would you join with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to conclude this morning with a blessing. But before we do, I'd like to call your attention to some discussion questions that we're going to be using here at the Awake office and that I know many of us scattered all over the Twin Cities area and all over the country are going to be using as well. We'd invite you to do the same thing. If you're gathered with another person or several people, just take some time to, to talk about these things together. If you're all by yourself, talk to the Lord about them. You know, he has invited us to pray without ceasing, to come before him at any time. And he loves it when his children share our stories, our faith, our concerns, our desires with him and with one another. Three questions to get us started today. And again, please don't feel that you've got to slavishly follow this. You may look at this and say, well, I'm just going to deal with this particular issue here. Or you may say, I'm not going to deal with any of those questions because there was something that came up in that message that I really need to, to resolve in my own heart and my relationship with God and talk with brothers and sisters about. But here are some things to get us started. First of all, what was your first love when you were in elementary school? 
What was it that you loved more than anything else when you were a kid? What, what comes back to mind? And how does that impact you then today? Number two, how do Jesus' commendations and his correction for the Ephesian believers relate in or to your own life experience? For each of us, the answers are going to be different. But for each of us, the implications are profound. And finally, number three, how would you describe being victorious in the Christian life? What does that look like in your life? What does that look like as you seek to follow Jesus today? I believe these are things worth discussing. And I also know this, when we talk about our faith with one another, not only are we strengthened individually, but we encourage other people and all of us are blessed. And so I would encourage you not just to walk away, but to talk about these things. Before you do, however, please receive this blessing from God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. May he guide your life in these coming days, and may he fill you with abundant joy in Jesus, our risen and soon-to-return Savior. Amen.